Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about something that we have not really done a deep dive on. We've touched on different parts of cloud security, but we're just going to do an overview of cloud security 101, some of the concepts, some of the things you should be familiar with. And then in subsequent episodes, we may do some deep dives on each individual component. But starting off, a lot of this was taken from a Gartner Guide to Cloud Security Concepts, which was published in September of 2021. So if you are a Gartner customer and you're able to access this report, which it is gated behind being a customer of Gartner, then go and find it, check it out. Otherwise, we are going to go through a lot of the things within the report today because there's a lot of good stuff here and it gives you a nice overview of the concepts and how to think about cloud security. And when we say cloud security, it is specifically kind of like infrastructure within the cloud. Like if you're using Azure or AWS or GCP, not necessarily like identity or any other things that we talk about generally. So some of the key findings in here, and the first one I thought was really interesting right off the bat, cloud security architecture and cloud security architect roles are key to the success of cloud computing initiatives because the cloud requires a different set of security design principles, processes, and technology. And cloud risk assessment must be automated to keep pace with business needs. Tier one providers are generally more secure starting points for workloads of all types. Many companies have adopted a multi-cloud strategy, which necessitates the use of third-party security tools for consistent policy and governance across a multi-cloud landscape. And then finally, end users are increasingly consuming hundreds of SaaS applications, multiple infrastructure as a service offerings, and are building new services using PaaS technologies. Cloud initiatives must therefore take account of the various cloud form factors used by many organizations. So all of this is very good. I want to hear your thoughts on that, Adam. Absolutely agree with the first point around that cloud security architecture requires a different set of skills. We were talking about this in the pre-show a little bit that you can kind of have a general awareness of computing infrastructure, how the pieces fit together, servers, databases, IP addresses, that sort of thing. And you can throw yourself into, say, the Azure interface and feel like you're in a whole nother planet. It's really, uh, there, there's some new concepts that are unique to cloud computing. And so having someone who has specialized in that over the course of their career and um, has built that subject matter expertise is really, really important because when you think of where information security has come from, in a lot of ways, it's been an outgrowth of network security in the networking team. And that's what led to kind of the first security model around that moat and castle approach. You know, we're going to have this secure internal corporate network where everything is implicitly trusted and we're going to protect the heck out of it with the, you know, the firewalls and network intrusion devices and all those sort of things. And again, like as those skills have needed to evolve into a zero trust mindset, cloud computing is also a different set of skills. So I think this is important. If your org is, you know, moving more and more to the cloud and, Pretty much every org is, then this is a place worth investing and do it at earlier as opposed to later. So you can establish blueprints and architecture and design principles that carry forward as you move more workloads into the cloud as opposed to having to go bolt on security later, which we all know as security professionals, security works a heck of a lot better when we bake it in from the get go, as opposed to trying to bolt it on later. I remember when we had Tanya Jenka on the show way back in the day, um, gosh, like a year and a half ago now, that's crazy. She talked about with application security, the same concept, like if you're building a house and you include all the designs in the initial blueprint of the house, it's cheaper to do that than try to add stuff on later and you get inferior results. So kind of same idea here. Um, multi-cloud is interesting because I know it's a, 
a risk mitigation technique by organizations. But I think there, there comes from like a really simple principle where people will, will spout concepts like, well, I don't want all my eggs in one basket. Okay. I mean, that's, that's a thing you can say, but when we really unpack that, there are costs inherent to that strategy. And so yes, many orgs have adopted multi-cloud multi-cloud makes everything more complicated. So while you might be mitigating risk here, you're introducing risk over there. And so I'd encourage orgs to really do their homework on that because I don't necessarily agree that that is just like the base default strategy for everyone moving forward, especially, you know, take into account the size and scale of your org. If you have a huge organization or a huge multinational, then maybe you can scale to manage that. But smaller orgs, there might just be more benefits with standardizing on one provider and, and leveraging that moving forward. Totally agree um, that if you do go multi-cloud, you need tools to manage across multi-cloud. Um, and I'd be remiss, <laughs> I know, you know, you said third party tools, but there is one cloud. And again, you know, who signs my paycheck, um, that is not only a cloud provider, but also a security provider. And that is Microsoft. And so Microsoft does have a lot of tools within Azure that actually scale across multi-cloud, which we're not going to really get into the weeds today, but just be aware that like in Azure, things like Defender for Cloud, Azure Arc, those scale across AWS and GCP. So you can make Azure kind of the center of your cloud security strategy. Anyhow, little, little tangent there. But absolutely, like, and then considering SaaS, IaaS, PaaS, you all called those out, Andy, there's a different approach needed to secure all of those. You know, SaaS in particular, things like Salesforce and Microsoft 365 have so many buttons and levers and configurations you can set where you really need to practice those individually versus things like IaaS and PaaS, maybe you can do in more of a scaled methodology. So you need to consider the needs of each one individually and not try to do a one size fits all strategy to secure all SaaS, IS, and PaaS. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but I wanted to bring up a point because Adam, you were thinking of multi-cloud in risk mitigation, which I think is part of some organization strategy because mm -hmm. that is something you need to take into consideration. If AWS goes down and all of your infrastructure is in AWS, then what happens to your business, right? So that's something businesses need to think about. But I also think a lot of companies today are in multi-cloud situations due to M&As, mergers and acquisitions. Maybe mm -hmm. you are in an AWS shop and then you do a acquisition or a merger with another company that is an Azure shop. And lifting and shifting those workloads out of one cloud and moving to another is... A project it's not something that is easily done and so you got to keep the lights on and so you kind of migrate or you got to develop a strategy to mitigate security risks in both environments just due to the company doing mergers and acquisitions i love that point that's really really valid because i did think of it like you said from a risk mitigation perspective but m a is part of it and what you just articulated could really be a driver for companies to want to be in a multi-cloud state already so that if they onboard additional M&A companies, they're already set up to do that. Like they don't have to spin up a multi-cloud practice all of a sudden because we just acquired a company that uses a different cloud than us. We're already used to that. We already do that. So sure, we can just start monitoring this new acquisitions, AWS environment as well, you know, until we're able to lift and shift it to Azure. That way you don't have to go do that legwork later. You've already done it. So that's a really good point. And I'm sure there's other scenarios that our listeners can think of as they're listening to the show right now, where you may be in a multi-cloud environment for reasons other than just risk mitigation. Although I do think, again, that's the major driver of, of people intentionally setting that as a desired architecture. And while I agree with that on some level, I think there needs to be a more nuanced discussion than just saying things like we don't want all our eggs in one basket. Cause I hear like CISO say that stuff all the time. And to me, sometimes it reflects a lack of real deep critical thinking on the subject. It's just, you know, a, a really high level concept and we're just going to roll with it. So in the Gartner report, they have a list of recommendations right off the bat, and then we'll kind of walk through some of these concepts, but Right from the start, they say security and risk management, technical professionals focusing on cloud security should start by defining 
their cloud security strategy and favoring cloud native provider tools augmented by third party tools according to the identified requirements, which that is just tagged onto the end. But I think that is a valid point to really consider because a lot of people don't sit down and really think about what are their requirements. Sometimes they find a tool and then they're like, oh, the tool does this. Yeah, we need that. But they never define the requirement beforehand. So you should really think about what you need as, as an organization before you look at the tools and let your requirements drive the tool selection rather than the tool driving your requirements. Um, they should also establish a cloud security architectural role, define best practices, stay agile, be nimble in the de- defining uh, process-based controls, use cloud access security brokers for their cloud app risk feature to automate and speed up cloud risk assessment. CASBs used to be a buzzword in the industry, and I haven't heard them in a minute, but in this Gartner report, they talk a lot about cloud access security brokers. So if you don't know what it is, we're going to go through it, but they use CASBs to protect sensitive data and you can approve or disapprove cloud apps. You can provide visibility based on the CASB agent, as well as define policies to have granular control over them. So CASBs are a very important part of cloud security, and it's mostly on the SaaS side. So that is part of the SaaS strategy to look at. Um, and then improving IaaS and PaaS visibility workloads insights across multiple clouds by deploying cloud security posture management, CSPM, cloud workload protection platform, CWPP, and combined cloud native application platform protection or CNAP vendor tools. So that's a lot of acronyms. We're going to walk through some of those, but um, those are the recommendations that Gartner has um, as per this report. I love starting with requirements. Andy and I, because of the nature of the work we do, we certainly run into customers chasing the shiny object and a lot of times we will try to take it back to, well, what are your requirements? What do you need? And a lot of times those haven't been defined yet. So again, like, like I'm, I, I'm a guy like, let me just take a total side tangent for one second. I've always remarked how iPhone as an example does not ship with an instruction manual. It's just like a tiny little pamphlet that tells you like how to turn it on and how to get started. And that's it. And the model for that really is like, if you design something well enough, it doesn't need an instruction manual because it shouldn't instruct you as you go. You know, if you have to sit down and read a whole book to know how to use something, then like it's not well designed. And so my thought has always been with IT, sometimes IT gets in its own way. We like to, well, we need to document this. We need to build this out. We need to um, write all this user-facing documentation so people know how this works. And like we create work for ourselves instead of just doing the thing. Now, that doesn't mean I'm against like process and procedure and being really buttoned up and formalized on some things. I just got done talking about requirements and drawing those up. But at the same time, you know, I know some of this is a drag, but I think this is something that's really important is the, is the point I'm making here in other areas. I, I definitely, and and you'll even hear it in the next bullet point. Andy talked about staying agile and nimble, right? Like let's not get bogged down in process and procedure and paperwork and bureaucracy. Like let's stay on top of what moves so quickly because the cloud changes so fast. Like we have to adopt some of our procedures to stay current, but on requirements, again, I know it's a drag, but plan out your requirements, you know, map those out. And I also love the call out, use native tools whenever possible. Native tools are often the best, they're most updated, and they're guaranteed to work with the stuff because they're going to be updated hand in hand as things change in the platform. When you have stuff that changes so frequently, anytime you build in a dependency on a third party tool, now that drags you down in your pace of innovation. So I'll give you a specific example. And this has gotten better over the years, but it used to be really problematic. Antivirus vendors. It used to be highly problematic for organizations to be able to update to a new Windows 10 feature update because antivirus vendors didn't support the new one. So the creator's update came out. Oh, well, we can't update to that because Symantec's not ready. 
oh, you know, 20 H1 came out. Oh, we can't update to that because CrowdStrike's not ready or whomever. I'm, I'm making stuff up. But you get the point, right? Like now you have this dependency that has become a drag on innovation and an ability to stay current and update. So by favoring cloud native providers tools whenever possible, you really limit that dependency acting as a drag on innovation. So I'm a big believer in that. Try to use Google, Amazon's, Microsoft's tools as much as possible. We already talked about the value of establishing a cloud security architect role. I did say stay nimble, stay agile, don't get bogged down in bureaucracy. Super important because this stuff changes so fast. And I love the call out on Casby's in a couple of places. And I think what's interesting here is when you think of how a lot of people use Casby, and again, that, that was, like you said, Andy, a buzzword that really talked about a bunch of different products with very differing feature sets. These are the kind of things that I do associate with CASB. So talking about like cloud app risk features. Now, the product I'm familiar with, it's not the only one, but Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps does this natively. It's built in where as you discover applications users are using in your environment, you can map that against a cloud app catalog and get a readout on the security posture of any SaaS application on the internet. Or you can just go search that catalog too. Super valuable feature. And I've always said security teams should be in this tool. And as they receive requests to onboard like a new SaaS application, that should be their first stop. It's not the end all be all, but certainly it's, it's a one page view of security posture to start your assessment, to start your evaluation. So use that. I also love using CASBs to do data protection in, um, in cloud applications that are sanctioned. So you can go in and establish policy to either automatically protect a document with information protection, or maybe just to set the correct permissioning on it. Great feature there. And then again, that visibility into, you know, what people refer to as shadow IT, scare quotes around it, having visibility into that and the ability to sanction or unsanction apps being used in a shadow IT fashion that's a really powerful feature as well. And certainly that's something I'm familiar with too. And finally, you talked about CSPM, CWPP, CNAP, all those different acronyms. This is where I kind of called out in the previous section, you know, there are third-party apps that do this really well. Palo Alto's Prisma comes to mind. It's a really good tool. Um, but I mentioned as well, Azure has this built in. Microsoft Defender for Cloud, Cloud Security Posture Management, it's built in. And some of that is, is actually free. It's just built in the platform it's included, and that'll give you alerts and call outs on security posture in your like VMs as an example that is less than ideal. Like maybe you have uh, remote desktop ports wide open to the public internet. You might want to change that. CWPP, again, Defender for Cloud has this, and it even works across multi-cloud as well. Um, and again, there's great third-party tools, but definitely something you should look into, especially if you're in a multi-cloud environment. Because those cloud workload protection platform tools, what's really neat about them is for a lot of them, they're kind of like flip a switch and then they start doing the thing. There's not a lot of care and feeding, configuration, ongoing maintenance required. You can literally say, start protecting all of my Cosmos DB databases in Azure. Okay, flip a switch and it will start protecting you and alerting you against you know anomalous behavior, malicious activity, uh, people doing things they shouldn't be in the database, like that's all super helpful. And from a security team perspective, like no onboarding, like be still my heart. That's amazing. So these are really, really, really great things to look at procuring because they have very limited or simple onboarding compared to a lot of our traditional tools. So they can really help up your security game with very minimal human investment, which is awesome. So walking through all of these different acronyms, we're going to talk about some different core security topics, starting with architecture, basic security, advanced security, some of the top providers, and then people and processes. So in architecture, there's a new concept here talking about cyber security mesh architecture or CSMA. And the concept of CMSA is really, instead of having perimeters and traditional controls, it modernizes the approach by deploying controls where they're most needed in a scalable, flexible, and resilient manner. And so ha rather than having the security tool run in a silo, a security mesh enables the tool to interoperate, and it does that by providing security services such as a distributed identity for fabric, like a 
identity provider, security analytics, intelligence, automation, and triggers, as well as a centralized policy management and orchestration. What that all means is you need to design things outside of that castle and moat concept and look at things that are in the cloud. And it's really, obviously, it's, it's, it's basic, and this is the textbook answer, and I understand that most organizations are not going to be there tomorrow, but um, it's, a, it's a path that you can map out for yourself. Um, part of that includes SASE architecture, and we haven't really specifically talked about SASE or secure access, secure edge architecture, but th- we have talked about concepts in that, like if you went back to our episode on VPNs versus SDPs, SASE is basically that. It's providing secure access to your applications or your environment on the edge rather than letting them into your environment. So the idea of having a VPN where it is a tunnel into your network is not zero trust network architecture. It's not sassy. So you want to use concepts like zero trust network architecture, authenticate users at the edge, and then provide them access to an application, probably using proxy-based security components, like a tunnel specifically to that application or um, app proxy like through Microsoft and that way you're not actually providing access into the the network and so that is part of the basic architecture of cloud security I like this a lot I hadn't heard this acronym till we recorded the show just now the CSMA cybersecurity mesh architecture but it makes sense and the way I kind of mapped it in my mind is is really simply like bringing the security, bringing the controls closer to the workload, as opposed to kind of building this all encompassing single perimeter that we just pray doesn't get bypassed. And then everything's kind of wide open on the inside of it. We're, we're moving those controls to smaller perimeters around each thing, essentially. So we do a perimeter around this um, resource. We do a perimeter around that resource. And and you can think of it as like individual force fields instead of one big force field. That's kind of how I think about it. Um, and I, and I really like all the call outs here. And again, you, like you mentioned, Annie, a lot of this is like textbook stuff like you should. And by what we mean by textbook is to say it, it mentions the concepts, obviously the devil's in the details. So you have to stitch all these components together, these concepts together but the concepts are sound, right? What you need to build is a foundational security services um, with a distributed identity fabric, security analytics, blah, blah, blah. Like you, you heard Andy read it. Um, but the point is you're, you're going to build this whole new kind of architecture with a new mindset um, in particular. So when you talk about like sassy architecture and you talk about this being a journey and organizations aren't there today, there is ample empirical evidence to show. And again, this is one of Adam's random tangents here that shows that bicycle helmet laws do not actually reduce the amount of um, bicycle accidents that cause injury on, on the contrary, it tends to be that in countries or municipalities or wherever that have bicycle helmet laws, there are more bicycle injuries than there are in places that don't have those mandated. Like for example, um, the canonical example is always called out like uh, the Netherlands, you know, like Amsterdam, you know, very big bicycle culture. And I believe no helmets are not required there. Now, there's more to it than that. You know, correlation is not causation. I get that. Um, but the concept there that a lot of people believe, because this this has really been shown to be fairly true, is that sometimes by mandating like security like this helmet there, and it delivers this false sense of security. It, it encourages people to engage in behaviors that are riskier overall and leads to a higher injury rate versus um, if you don't kind of mandate that or don't have that false sense of security like that helmet, um, it actually does risk mitigation across the board. I'm grossly simplifying the concepts here. You could actually do a web search on this to learn more because this is something there's a lot of people smarter than me that talk about. But where I'm going with all this is to say that 
You know, I, I run into organizations still to this day that do things like, you can only authenticate if you are behind a corporate firewall. I'm like, what? what year is this again? <laughs> you know, like, come on, guys. Like, this is totally behind the time stuff. And, you know, we, we maybe laugh or joke or whatever. But the point is that when you're still in that model, if you're trying to move to a SASE, zero trust kind of model, um, that encourages like that false sense of security. That's why it's so important to adopt this mindset and to really shift your thinking is because that old thinking encourages things like, well, you know, if it's behind the firewall, it's safe. And, and that's like a really dangerous mindset to have. You need to assume there are adversaries inside your network right now. Where I'm going with all this is to get at that, like that model where we're not dropping people on a VPN that has full unfettered access to the rest of our corporate network. Like, yes, you need to get away from that. Um, and, and oftentimes with, uh, Microsoft IT, we do lead the way on some of this stuff. For example, with passwordless, I always talk about with passwordless before passwords can go away, we have to have credible alternatives to passwords, right? So a lot of people are like, well, until I can use passwordless everywhere, I'm not going to deploy it. Like that's, that's not how it works. You know, you're still going to have to put in your password sometimes. Yes. Occasionally I do have to put in my Microsoft password. It's very rare at this point. In fact, I'd be worried. I may have forgotten it, but I can still find times rarely where I have to still provide my password. Most of the time it's passwordless at this point with zero trust network architecture with SASE, It's like that. So you can't decommission your VPN and get rid of it until you have credible alternatives in place. So, and you call that like Azure AD app proxy C scaler is often, you know, called out as well as something that can maybe do some of this stuff. Some, some Casby's do some of this stuff, but the point is like, until you start to get to the model where I can get to this internal application and I'm getting just access to that one app through some sort of app proxy type model, then you can't decommission your VPN. And so even today, as, as much as like MSIT does a really good job of being forward thinking, we still have a VPN. Now I will say what's cool is they've gotten so confident that it's rarely needed that the VPN is now off by default on windows clients. You have to manually initiate a connection to use it. And I will say, I go weeks at a time without enabling VPN. I rarely need it to conduct my day-to-day -day work. It is a rare time I have to fire it up for some like ancient internal application. Like we have this really old instance of sale point. They have to turn it on to get to, but past that I don't. And so long winded discussion short, what I'm saying is when you hear about all these things, just keep in mind that you don't have to solve all of it day one. But you do have to start putting the pieces together. You do have to start having those credible alternatives in place before you can get all the way to the promised land. So don't wait for everything to be solved before you get started. That's not how this works. You get to that point by being diligent and persistent and moving things as you can. And then you reach a point one day where you're like, holy smokes, we've got everything moved to this new app proxy type model, this sassy model, and now we can decommission our VPN. Awesome but you don't get there by waiting until that's all fixed and then doing it in one big bang. So, you know, you got to start the work now. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but I understand also having worked in, in internal it that some of these initiatives may be security driven, but you have to partner with other folks in the organization, which really means that you need top-down buy-in. Mm -hmm. If you don't have top-down buy-in, you don't have the leaders embracing and understanding why you need to move to these things, then you're not going to get it done. Because VPN, as an example that we're talking about here, requires your network folks to be on board. Application access requires those application owners to be on board. And so there's a lot of stakeholders in just this one topic that we're talking about, like specifically VPN, mm -hmm. that you need leadership driven initiatives from this point. Um, you as a security practitioner may be the one kind of prompting it, but without that leadership buy-in and then stakeholder um, buy-in, you're not gonna get these initiatives done. Absolutely. So on basic security, we really want to talk about the cloud native security. And so if you are an M365 customer, there's security stuff that's built in there. Some of it costs money. Some of it is included. 
if you're in a um, multi-cloud environment, you know, there are native tools. Azure has its own native security tools. It has its own cloud security posture management. It has cloud workload protection platforms. Same thing with AWS. If you're in AWS, they have their own security tools built in. Cloud security posture management, AWS security hub. Um, GCP has its own security. Salesforce has its own security. So look to those native security controls first, because as Adam said, they're often built for the platform. They're easy to deploy. And it's a low hanging fruit that you can just get done. So we call that basic security. Once you get that done, then you look at some more advanced securities added on. So for example, CASB, if you're looking at Microsoft, we obviously have our own internal CASB, which is included in the M365 platform. You may be looking external as well. And so now you're talking about a bolt on third party tool, but that may work. So look at that, but also understand that there are different ways of implementing CASB. There's forward proxy and reverse proxy. I'm not going to dive too much into it, but one sits in front of the application, one sits in front of the server, and it does it, it does um, influence how your security policies are driven based on how it is proxied. And then cloud native application platforms, which are the cloud workload protection platforms, the cloud security posture management. And then you have what we talked about last week, The cloud infrastructure entitlement management, which is fairly new and on the rise, it gets a call out here as well. Kubernetes security posture management. So if you are working with containers and Kubernetes, uh, SQL servers in the cloud, you know, all of that has different protections that can be implemented for those specific things. Obviously, I'm going to say that Microsoft has those for Defender for Cloud. Those are all parts of it. But as well as AWS, they have their own specific workload protection um, native to their platform. So, and then API discovery and protection tools. A lot of that stuff is automated today using APIs. You want to protect those APIs. And really what all that leads to and all these different acronyms and complexity, it really leads to that new role that we talked about at the top of the show, this cloud security architect, because These concepts are very different than traditional identity, traditional endpoint management, that perimeter. Once you've established it, you just got to protect your devices and all that. I think as security has evolved over the years, starting with network, and then we started getting mobile devices, and now we need to figure out how to do access to those devices and manage those. And now we have this whole different part as infrastructure is moving to the cloud and how to automate and protect that. You have these different roles and people specializing it. Now, understandably, I think at most organizations, you may only have one or two guys or gals and they have to be generalists. That's what most IT practitioners are or security practitioners. They're generalists. They know a little bit about everything. But if you are a larger organization, you really want to look at specializing this role and hiring someone who is a cloud security architect. Now, if you can't, then that's okay. You can partner with your cloud engineers who are deploying the infrastructure and provide them guidance. You need to have an understanding that when they're looking at developing a process or looking at developing some sort of automation, that they get buy-in from the security team and at least have a review and say, yeah, we think or we know this is the way to go. This is the secure way to go. And you provide that guidance if they're not security minded. And so that's, I think, where most organizations need to move to. Just like we talked about, you know, having a specialized role for asset management like that Mm -hmm. is something that most organizations don't do. Um, It falls on some poor you know help desk guy or whatever but that's a security uh it's a security function asset management um so this is a security function specializing in the cloud i'm gonna do like a rose and a thorn here so a rose that on linkedin because of what my profile looks like most people don't actually pick up that i'm a salesperson and so I'm always getting job applications or, or job offers or proposals or whatever um, for security roles. And I will say, 
I have started to see LinkedIn has bubbled up to me a lot of new cloud security architect roles at organizations. So a rose to those organizations that have already like built out this role and have posted it and are actively hiring for it. I'm seeing this happen right now. So maybe they read the Gartner report, but I'm seeing a lot of this in real life. So that's awesome. I am super excited to see that. Um, maybe a slight thorn and Andy, maybe your experience can differ from mine. But when I've been in enterprise IT, and I spent the first many years of my career there before I moved to Microsoft, a lot of my architects were not the sharpest. It was like a way to reward like longevity at a company and like create a new role that was above like the most senior technical roles. Like it's the most senior technical role. And it was like almost like a career achievement award to give somebody like an architect role. And the problem was these people were like so old school and so removed from like how things worked day to day that they clearly just didn't understand how stuff worked. Now don't do that. And maybe that's unique to my experience because I did work for a lot of extremely conservative organizations where people retired from, um, and financial services companies in particular, you know, are not exactly the most forward thinking and that's how they operated. And that would be the worst thing you could do here. And so again, I know like our listeners are not a whole bunch of uh, um, like a C-suite folks who are, who are creating these roles right now or anything, but as much as you can influence this and share with this, like this is not like somebody's last job before retirement. This is not for them to roll off into the sunset here to reward like 20 years of being our top mainframe technical person. Okay. Like that's not who this is for. This needs to be for somebody who's nimble and agile and really on top of the current trends in cloud infrastructure and can stay on top of that moving forward. And can you talked about, this is a senior role in the fact that you have to influence a lot of decision makers from a lot of different practices of IT. You have to have individual knowledge of multiple disciplines, right? This is clearly a very senior role, but I'm just saying like, this isn't the career achievement award role. And I've seen architecture used that way in the past. And again, maybe that's just my one man's experience, but to be honest, when I was in IT, I thought most of my architects were boobs. Like they just weren't, they weren't super sharp on how stuff was actually happening. Like these are the people defining our architecture. Like they don't even know this stuff works. Like it was bizarre. So again, if you, if I worked with you in the past, you were an architect, sorry. Um, send me a LinkedIn message. We'll get coffee and talk about it. But uh, <laughs> that's kind of my perception here. So anyhow, I love the role and I'm excited orgs are hiring for it, but make sure it's the right people. And finally, people and processes, and you need to do some risk assessment. And we talked about that at the top of the show, kind of in a multi-cloud strategy and, and looking at that. But you really need to sit down and do a risk assessment of your cloud strategy and understanding how those risks are addressed by security controls in the cloud. And a lot of times, you know, the, some of the challenges with this include like, you don't understand some of the existing systems and processes and you struggle because evaluating risk of public cloud service relationships is challenging. Like I said, if the majority of your stuff is in AWS and AWS goes down, then all of a sudden your business goes down. And so you need to have professionals who are able to judge the adequacy and insufficiency of vendor controls as well as their SLAs and all of that. Right. Um, and, uh, the service assessments themselves require deeper involvement of stakeholders. This absolutely needs to at least start with probably security, but it is a business initiative to understand the risk that using public clouds have to the organization and to the business, because, like I said, it's going to directly correlate to whether or not your business is functioning or not. It can be a, a even like a, you know, like a, a business continuity plan as part of this. If your public cloud infrastructure is unavailable for a certain period of time. So some of the things that you should think about, can the organization tolerate all of its data housed in the service and losing all of that? Can it, can it 
lose only the data since last Saturday? Like, what are the risks and, you know, can we, can we handle that? Can the organization serve customers and meet contractual obligations when the service is unavailable? Do stakeholders understand the use of internet connectivity and how that can impact performance and availability of services? If everything is online and you don't have stuff to connect to online, then how does that work? You got to understand and, and work with these stakeholders of the business to figure out what are the real risks of using the cloud. And so that I think is the, the capstone of this whole thing. It is the final piece after you kind of walk through all of the other things that we've talked about and, you know, working with the business to figure out where the real risks lie. I really liked this section and I particularly liked the section where Gartner was deeply skeptical to put it professionally of the value of risk assessments for most organizations. Cause I can tell you, as a vendor who's on the other side of those assessments, generally speaking, A, they're super annoying. B, I question the value returned from them. Because what I find oftentimes, they're inspired by audit checklists, absolutely. But they're like asking the wrong questions, and they're really like majoring in the minors. They're focusing on things that um, just aren't that important or that honestly, like the big three are really buttoned up on. So let me let me just like get on my soapbox for a second, which... I've done the whole show, but we'll continue. For the big three, AWS, Azure, and GCP. If you're like digging into a whole bunch of questions around basic operational hygiene and operational efficiency, you are wasting your time. The big three are so buttoned up on operations. It's 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 in another universe compared to when you used to run your data center in house. Like it's not even close. It's an order of magnitude different, how buttoned up and how serious they take operations. And so what I mean by operations is like physical security, data destruction, patching and maintenance, um, having, having multiple, you know, internet pipes going in and out of this facility, having multiple redundant power connections, like having generators on standby fueled up with diesel ready to go, like having fault tolerance built in their fault tolerance is better than you ever had in your on-prem data center. Like, so I get these risk assessments and it's like, really like, do, do you require key cards to get access to your data center? Like, yes. What do you think? Like we just let anybody like, I mean, that is not valuable. That's not bringing value to your organization. And first off, we're all going to tell you we do, um, which is true. But like the operations of the big three are so good. Like that's not a concern. Like when we're talking about failures here, we're talking about like massive, unpredictable, super bizarre reasons for these to fail. And and even when they fail, like and and I've been in this business now for five and a half years of cloud computing. And yes, have there been certain regions that have had really bad days? We had a fire um, at the South Central Azure Data Center, and it was pretty bad. And some of the failovers didn't work as expected. And a lot of lessons were learned from that. And we've had Azure AD outages, although nothing for like almost two years now, um, where again, some of like the fail safes didn't work as expected. But like we've had two years basically of perfect operations. Like Azure AD has been up and running and available and perfect for you know a couple of years. And I, I just think of like, yes, should you plan for like the absolute risk case scenario? Sure. But I think instead of like getting into these questionnaires that look like audit reports, and then how do we even like compare them? Like your assumption should be if we have stuff in AWS, GCP, or Azure, like the operations are sound. Could there be a failure? Yes. What are the most likely failures? Like this, this region goes offline. Okay. It's supposed to fail over to this. Will that work? Do we have stuff where we're manually like creating a, a twin in a different region? Okay. You know, like generally speaking, if you have like cross regional redundancy, like you're not going to go down. Like you're just not like at a certain point, like now you're planning for, well, what if a media sh meteor shower hit the earth and it managed to perfectly impact uh, eight of Amazon's data centers all at the same time. Like what would happen then? Like there's a certain point of you're so far outside the realm of possibility that there's no value coming from it. So focus on your unique 
architecture, your unique infrastructure, what's unique to your org. And instead of spending all the time, like asking these questions, like, do you drill your hard drives when you dispose of them? Like, yes, we shred them. Like, seriously, like I, I, I just find there's so much focus on this stuff. That's like, yes, Amazon does that. Google does that. Microsoft does that. Operations are really, really sound at all of those places. So um, that's my soapbox a little bit here, but I do like kind of what was called out here on, you know, like, oh, the risk assessment process will save us. Like you have a checklist, <laughs> you know, does that, is that meaningful? Can you create meaningful insights from that? And I think that's something where instead of like relying on a checklist, asking those questions like, okay, you know, what if AWS goes down? What then? Well, we've learned what happens when AWS goes down. A lot of stuff goes down right? Like Netflix stops working and Hulu stops working and Spotify stops working. So the answer those orgs have answered is, yeah, our stuff breaks. And maybe that's okay because that's so rare that happens. Um, and again, I always think of it too. This is where I've always found this was odd. Customers get hung up on like, oh, well, you know, Azure AD went down once two years ago. Like, you know what? Again, I came from enterprise IT, and let me tell you, when we ran all our stuff in-house, it went down way the heck more than that. Like Active Directory went down, like Lotus Notes went down, like stuff went down internally. And so people get this perception like that cloud should be absolutely perfect with absolutely no downtime or failures allowed, even though when they ran all this stuff on-prem, they had, they had failures all of the time. Like there's still an order of magnitude improvement, but that's not recognized. And so, again, you could go multi-cloud. You could create even more redundancy. There are costs inherent in that, and there are risks inherent with that. And you look at a lot of major technology companies today, they have all their eggs in the AWS basket, and they're okay with that. So I question sometimes, like, if you're, you know, a mid-sized enterprise, like, Hulu has decided they're okay with just that going down. Maybe you are, too. Like I, I'm not a huge fan of multi-cloud. I, maybe you can tell from this call because I think orgs greatly, grossly overestimate like the impacts of, or the likelihood of one in cloud infrastructure provider going down. And I think they grossly underestimate the risks inherent with the multi-cloud model and all of the costs inherent with it. So off my soapbox and we can move on, but um, I did like the Gartner call out here because I have been on the other side of it and I've really questioned the value of a lot of the things that I've been forced to complete in the past. So to wrap it all up, this was just an introduction to a lot of the security concepts. And so if this was overwhelming, just, you know, if you're starting out, you really want to define a cloud security architect role if you're heavily on that side and the responsibilities so that you have someone who's going to lead you in building your strategy, uh, which would start with the cloud native stuff and then moving on to other p tools that you may add on. And you want to do that based on your identified requirements, which you talked about. You really want to look at defining your operational security policy if you haven't done that. And that includes specifics like how many administrators do you want per user? Uh, how many devices you have um, and how are you going to manage that versus unmanaged devices? Browser versions even, like should you be using older browsers or define a specific standard for your organization, which may have implications on the types of apps you can run? Types of data, data classification, that is so important, right? That is data discovery and then defining what is critical and what is not. If you don't know what type of data you have, you can't protect it. And so that's a lot of, you know, organizations are trying to protect the crown jewels. Well, tell me what the crown jewels are. Like, have you even looked at that, you know? Um, and, uh, and and then what type of actions you're going to take, you know, based on the security policies. If, if you have something, are you going to block it? Are you going to allow it? Are you going to coach the user? And... So these are all critical phases of your you know, security journey before you even look, look at buying the tools. And then once you have the policies defined, then you can look at tools to enforce those policies like a CASB, like uh, a cloud security posture management, like CNAP and all these other things. And so define your policies first, know what you have that you're protecting, and then look at tools to solve those specific requirements. 
I remember coming from enterprise IT, one of the last projects I did before I came to Microsoft was a lot of mobile device management, actually at both my companies before I came to Microsoft. And one of the things that surprised me at the time was even in the mid 2010s, that was still a relatively new practice at some companies. Like it really wasn't mature. And I had a high level of latitude, even in, you know, companies, some of them I work for had five, six, 7,000, you know, users. I basically like, like invented the, the mobile device, like security requirements. Like I just made them up. Like I'm in into like click and drop downs, like, Oh, I'm going to require, you know, operating system version minus one. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Like I just defined them. I made them up up the top of my head. Like these are our standards. <laughs> <laughs> and and so it's when I think about this, I still see this happen at orgs a lot where they'll get a new tool. And because there hasn't been like a conversation bringing all the stakeholders together on, okay, what should we enforce? What should we allow? What should we require? A lot of times it's like whoever's implementing the tool kind of just makes that up based on what they feel like is appropriate for the org. And I think there's a lot of value in that person having a major say in that. Because for example, me as the subject matter expert on mobile devices, I could say, well, let me tell you why we want to require the most recent version of iOS. Apple doesn't patch old versions. They don't ship security updates for the previous iOS release. At the time, they didn't. And so really, we're in introducing a lot of risk by allowing minus one. But I'm trying to be considerate of people on like an iPhone 5S or whatever at the time, you know. And that's like there should be influence and input. But there, everyone needs to get together to create that. And so I really like this call it that operational cloud security policy. So much of that needs to be defined and, and should be agreed upon. And I'm not saying groupthink is the solution to everything because it's not. But having other stakeholders weigh in and say, well, you know, we still have a fleet of devices running Windows 8.1. So we need to consider that. We need to still have a strategy for that. That's valuable input, you know, as an example. So... Those are great things, and I, and I kind of like the order of operations too. On on what kind of tools to start with first, you know, start with CASB, move on to CSPM and CWPP. That makes sense. Um, and I don't think you mentioned this, Andy, but then SASE is kind of that long term north star for remote access. And and I mentioned when we talked about that earlier, like you won't get there day one, but you get there by starting to do the work. And starting to move applications to that model because you have to have a credible alternative to VPNs before you can get rid of VPN. And even at companies that are extremely progressive and forward looking in their IT infrastructure like Microsoft, we still have a VPN. It's just not enabled by default. So like the North Star of nobody needs VPN, that's a long way off, I think, even for the most progressive companies. But we have to start doing the work today to get to that model. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about on future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.